Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Now, you would have heard a broken record if you had witnessed all our shows in the past few weeks. Night after night, we repeat the same thing. What is our message? To alert the public that the IMF will not solve our problems. However, if you look at what's happening right now, you see the rupee appreciating against the dollar, the fuel prices are getting slashed, dollar reserves are going up, and everything seems to be back to normal. Or is it? We need to dive deep into what's happening now. We don't have to look around the world for that. We just have to refer to the six, uh, 16th IMF program that Sri Lanka was in from, I think, July 2016 um, uh, to January of 2019. Being in that IMF program decreased our GDP growth from 5% to 2.3%. So, is it better the 17th time around? Good question. And even more, a better question would be, as a citizen of this country, are you aware of what entails this IMF agreement? Uh, joining me now from the data board is Danidu Itharmasam. Danidu, good to see you once again. And now I know for a fact that you have been reading the whole 151 pages of the IMF agreement. Um, this time around, which is what I think the president also tabled at parliament. So what did you find out? Good news for us? Well, Mahesh, unfortunately, I can't be bearing good news at the data board, and that has been something consecutively that we have dealt with. When looking at the IMF report, we see that there have been a number of projections that we need to really look into deeper that will have harmful impacts in the coming days. One of the key expectations is to reach a primary budget balance surplus of 2.3% of GDP from 2025 onwards, from a deficit of 3.8% in 2022, a target that can only be reached by moves such as selling off treasury shares in SOEs. In terms of funding, it is expected that multilateral development banks are to provide 3.7 billion US dollars during the program period which is from 2022 to 2027, of which the World Bank is to provide 1.7 billion US dollars and the Asian Development Bank is to provide 2 billion US dollars. In 2023 alone, the World Bank will provide 250 million US dollars and the Asian Development Bank will provide 650 million US dollars for budget financing. It must be noted that debts to multilateral developmental banks must be paid back even by defaulted nations. Gross official reserves are expected to rise to 4 billion US dollars in 2023 and 11 billion by 2025, which will be financed by foreign exchange purchases from the market directly. The expectation here is that an organic rise in foreign exchange inflows within the country would occur, an assumption with no merit. Well, Mahesh, as you have seen, not a lot of changes from what the IMF generally proposes. We see that at all costs, a primary budget surplus needs to be gained. We see that with high uh, fiscal fiscal changes that are happening, high taxation. SOE prioritization. We are looking at profit-making SOEs that are being prioritized. The treasury shares are being sold out. And the central bank independent, the apparent independence of the central bank, which no other state has been doing, which states are actually moving away from, and will not allow the central bank to work with the legislature, that is the parliament, in funding, their re in funding the budget. Now, we don't know how this will come about, but very yes. disastrous consequences. I have about. a funny feeling, Danidu, and this is uh, completely in my opinion, that this would, uh, uh, you know, there could be so much of uh, back and forth with, yeah. with the legislature and the central bank and what they can do, and it might end up at the Supreme Court, you know, try to fix and try to figure it out. Um, yeah. We've seen these types of pilot projects implemented by various uh, international organizations in Sri Lanka, and then we are the one who has to suffer. They there's no consequence for the IMF whether this goes right or bust. That is with Anwar as always. Thank you very much at the data board. Well, I want to understand and get a take on the agreement from a neutral party. And for that, I'm now joined by the senior lecturer at the University of Jaffna, Professor Ahilan Kadragamar, who he joins me via Zoom all the way from Jaffna. Thank you very much, Professor, for your time. Now, what is your take on the IMF uh, agreement with Sri Lanka? How do you interpret the 17th program of the IMF? Mahesh, um, this IMF agreement, the 17th, is probably going to be, be the most significant IMF agreement that Sri Lanka has gone into. Now, we started our first agreement in 1965. Up to now, the most significant ones were in 1977-78, when we went through what is called structural adjustment or in Sri Lanka, what we call the open economy reforms, which set us on what we call a neoliberal path, that is in terms of a free market economy, uh, free trade, free flow of capital, which is also what pushed us to uh, invite 
foreign capital in, in a major way, but also in the form of debt, which has led to the current debt crisis. Right now, we have gone to the IMF having defaulted on our debt. And this is the first time in our history that we have defaulted on our debt. And the IMF has put two conditions on us that even as early as next year, that we should have a primary budget surplus. That means our revenues should be higher than our expenditure. But this target is almost impossible because just uh, two years ago, our primary budget deficit was on the order of 5.7% deficit. And from there to suddenly reach a um, surplus, it's going to be virtually impossible. Next, they have, are demanding that we restructure our debt with uh, our creditors and almost 53% of our foreign debt is commercial borrowing, a lot of it uh, international sovereign bonds. So these bondholders and there are vulture funds who are going to hold out. Now, these conditions make it virtually impossible, but we have to go through extreme austerity measures with great suffering to the people to be able to continue with this IMF agreement. Indeed, uh, understood uh, very clearly. Uh, all right, we have to leave it at that. Uh, that was the senior lecturer at the University of Jaffna, Professor Ahilan Kadragamar. Now, a criticism of the current government was uh, that the deal they negotiated with the IMF uh, was weak, mainly because we were negotiating uh, when our economy had gone bust, hence we were not on a stronger footing. However, I'm inquisitive to know what a person who had previously negotiated an IMF deal thinks about the current agreement. Uh, joining me now is a former governor of the central bank, Ajit Nimad Kabral, who was in fact the person who negotiated, I think, the uh, six, uh, 15th IMF program in 2009. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, for your time. Appreciate it. Now, what are your thoughts on the current agreement? Will it be beneficial to Sri Lanka? Good evening, Mahesh. Good to be on your show. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, many people ask this question, some think that it's going to do a lot of good for Sri Lanka uh, and I don't want to dash their hopes but if you look at the IMF agreement itself, the agreement that they have uh, stated that there are exceptional risks to this, uh, to this um, program, exceptional risks and that's not a word that they normally use. Now what are these exceptional risks? They're talking about the debt restructuring challenge. They're talking about the exchange rate becoming quite uh, volatile as well as under being under pressure. They talk about the political uncertainty. They talk about the difficulties of revenue mobilization, particularly in a low growth scenario. They're talking about the economic fallout, the weakened banking sector. We must remember that when we are going to have a haircut on the ISPs as well as probably on the local debt, and they have given many hints about that in the agreement itself, there is bound to be a lot of pressure being brought upon the banking sector and the NBFI sector. Now, these together with the challenges that the EPF will face, because EPF has about 29% of the entirety of the government debt, uh, as far as the treasury, bills are, treasury bonds are concerned, and the EPF has 94% of its investment in government treasuries. So if there is going to be any local debt restructuring, that's going to be a, of enormous significance to all the people in our country, and that could be a major political uh, situation as well that we'll have to face. There's going to be market confidence being er eroded. And with all these, I think we are going to have a very, very tough time. We're also going to see two distinct dates which are going to be of great significance. First is the 30th of April, by which time the government has to come up with its restructuring plan. Now that plan is going to be of uh, serious significance to the entire country. And when that comes up, I think it's going to have a fair bit of uh, discussion taking place. And I don't believe that is going to be very benign as well, those discussions. The second is going to be 30th of June, 
by which time the government has to say as to how it's going to roll over or, or roll back the exchange rate uh, restrictions, exchange restrictions that are currently in place, as well as the, the other programs that the government has instituted in order to maintain a certain fixed exchange rate position. Now, when those rules ro roll back, there would definitely be additional pressure on the rupee as well, and those are going to be very difficult challenges that the government will face. So I think the government has its work cut out and the central bank work cut out. Restructuring is going to be a very, very difficult program. And uh, I have been always saying that um, instead of restructuring, we should have been looking at some other type of uh, arrangement with the creditors. And now uh, it's there. So I, I believe the government will have to face those challenges fairly and squarely. Indeed. Uh, Governor, what can Sri Lankans expect in the coming few months? Is there anything positive to look forward to? I'm afraid I'll have to say that we'll have to expect a lot of uncertainty, a great deal of uncertainty. As of now, we are feeling that. We know that there is nothing certain. We don't know where the rupee would be. We don't know where the interest rates would be. We don't know what kind of market confidence levels we'd be looking at. We don't know how the debt restructuring is going to be done. We don't know what impact it will have on local institutions. Uh, we are also going to see a large number of asset sales as to whether those could take place in the current political environment is another question. Whether those could be supported by the current uh, regime is also another question. So we have, we have to face a large number of uncertainties. And those uncertainties are not uh, easy to deal with. And those are all escalating towards some kind of a, a position where it can be, uh, I, I'm, uh, I, I feel bad to say this, but it could be a perfect storm. And if it's a perfect storm, the fallout could be extremely difficult and it would need a great deal of skill as well as a great deal of diplomacy to ride it through. And I would like to see that happening. And I hope there would be a leadership that could deal with it. Because if that cannot be done, we're going to have some serious difficulties ahead of us. Indeed, um, very tough times ahead. Let's hope at least we will try to come out this time around because our people cannot be suffering this much, I think from 2019 onwards. All right, we have to leave it at that. Uh, appreciate it. That was the former governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nimad Kapra. Now, before we take a break, I want to know what the current opposition, the Samagi Janabalavege, thinks about this IMF deal. Watch. We, the SJB, we think that uh, we, sh we shouldn't have agreed to all these uh, conditions. However, I think the circumstances uh, uh, were not in our favour. So uh, we had to agree to get the IMF. So we believe uh, and we always tell the uh, government to start negotiating as soon as possible, especially when it comes to the uh, income tax and also other uh, uh, conditions. We believe that the uh, government of Sri Lanka should uh, somehow uh, convince the IMF uh, to uh, benefit the Sri Lankans, uh, the population in the country, because the majority of the population, they are finding very difficult to live. The cost of living has gone uh, extremely high and the income tax is unbearable. So uh, we are happy that the IMF uh, uh, is uh, uh, given to us and we, we should work from here. All right, that was a member of parliament from the opposition, Samagi Jana Balavege, Harshana Rajakarana. Let's take a short commercial break. Upon our return, I'll tell you what's happening in Zambia and their efforts with the IMF. You'll be surprised to hear some very familiar stories. Stick around. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment.